Hello and welcome everyone. Happy Earth Day. We're so excited to be with you today and to be joining our partners at the Oregon Zoo. Uh, we're here for a virtual field trip and to talk about polar bears. I'm Marisa Kraus with Polar Bears International and this program will run about 30 minutes today. <clears throat> We have several guests with us who we'll introduce shortly, who will share their knowledge and stories with you. And during today's live event, we'll talk about some of the things that we learn from studying polar bears, some of the tools that we use to conduct research, and we'll take a look at the Oregon Zoo's brand new and cutting edge polar bear exhibit. And if we're lucky, get to see Nora exploring her new habitat. We encourage you to use the chat window um, on the website below if you're watching on our website or the comments and social media to ask questions, share from where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and as always, if you're a younger student tuning in today, please ask an adult for permission first when using the internet. We're gonna start by introducing our guests, but um, as some of you may know, we always have folks behind the scenes helping us out. And today we've got some team members, Kayla running the chat box below, uh, fielding comments and getting those to our panelists. KT is running the tech and bringing you some of the images and uh, film today. And then we've also got Shervin behind the scenes at Oregon Zoo. So thank you everyone uh, for making this possible today. And on the screen that you see now, we have Elisa McCall and Amy Cutting joining us. Elisa, could you introduce yourself and then pass to Amy? Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Elisa. I'm up in Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada, and I'm the Director of Conservation Outreach and one of the staff scientists at Polar Bears International. And I have been involved with tracking polar bears for quite a few years now, especially those in Hudson Bay. So I'm really excited to talk to you about some polar bear research today. Hi everybody, my name is Amy Cutting and I am an animal curator at the Oregon Zoo. I've also been volunteering with Polar Bears International for 20 some years now. Uh, so it's really exciting to be able to share our new habitat with you. We'll also talk a little bit about how zoo bears can contribute to conservation science. Uh, I think it'll be a nice counterpoint. Oh, there's Nora playing in the pool, excellent. Um, Nora is uh, enjoying our new habitat and sometimes you'll see her uh, being active, um, hopefully not distracting from the excellent content that we wanna share today, but that's a great shot of her enjoying her new deep pool. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Elisa and Amy. Thanks again uh, for joining us today. So we're here to talk about polar bears. And uh, as many of you know, polar bears are marine mammals. And so they're built to live on top of the frozen ocean. So I'd love it if, Elisa, you could start out today by sharing some of the amazing adaptations that polar bears have for surviving Arctic conditions and a life upon the sea ice. Absolutely, I'd love to talk about some adaptations. I will say really quick so people aren't distracted that in the video behind me, it's one of the explore.org polar bear cams on Cape West. And so we watch these cams all the time to see what's going on on the tundra. And these are just outside of Churchill, Manitoba. And there is a raven hanging out today. So that's what I have on behind me. But let's talk about some polar bear adaptations. So uh, in that image that you just saw of polar bears, you maybe noticed the polar bear's big feet and very sharp claws. So this is a polar bear claw. You can see it's very thick and very sharp, very sharp point. Now this claw is perfect for giving a little bit of traction on slippery ice and for helping grip seals. Now seals are the polar bear's main prey and you can imagine they're a little bit slippery. Polar bears generally hunt by standing on the ice waiting at a seal hole. A seal comes up to breathe and a polar bear pounces into the hole and drags the seal out. There's an example of a seal coming out of a breathing hole now. So there, a seal's gonna be wet and slippery and the polar bear needs good grip. So the polar bear uses its claws to really dig into that seal and pull it out. Now a brown bear claw would be a lot longer and a bit more dull because brown bears are walking on the land, they're rolling over logs, they don't need quite as sharp claws as polar bears. Polar bears also have very, very thick fur. So this is an example of polar bear fur. And it's kind of hard to see here, but there are two layers of fur. So polar bears have a very thick downy under layer, kind of like us wearing a wool sweater. And then the hairs over top are a little bit longer and more repel water away. So kind of having a rain jacket on top. So between these two very thick layers of fur, polar bears are able to keep very warm in the Arctic. Now this fur is also clear. It's not actually white, it just looks white to us. So it's mostly transparent and mostly hollow as well. 
and hollow hair helps trap warm air against the bear's body, also helping them keep warm when it's even minus 50 degrees Celsius or lower up in the Arctic. And one more thing about polar bears, of course, is their very sharp teeth to also catch those seals. Here's a polar bear mock skull here, you can see, trying to line that up with my camera. Polar bears have very sharp teeth. They're the most carnivorous of all the bears on earth, so very sharp teeth. And their molars even are quite sharp for shearing the fat and the blubber from seals. So polar bears actually though, don't have quite as strong jaws as brown bears. Again, polar bears main prey are seals, pretty squishy. And brown bears eat more terrestrial foods, which are a lot more crunchy a lot of the time. So polar bears are very strong, very strong jaws, but not quite as strong as brown bears, which is pretty interesting. So there are a lot of adaptations that make it so that polar bears are a very well adapted Arctic animal. And like Marisa said, a marine mammal. Thank you, Elisa. That was a great introduction into some of those adaptations. Um, you know, we know that polar bears use those adaptations for their life upon the sea ice. And polar bears rely on that sea ice to travel, to hunt, to breed, and to sometimes den. And so we know that sea ice loss from climate change is also their single biggest threat. Global climate, climate change is shortening the sea ice season in several regions around the Arctic. And so it's important that we study different aspects of the polar bear's life in relation to other organisms and in relation to their sea ice habitat to better understand how they may respond uh, to a changing climate. So whether we're counting polar bears, locating maternal dens, uh, studying the behavior of mums and cubs when they emerge from those dens, or studying stress hormones or tracking the movements of polar bears, it's all super valuable information. And with different studies, we ask different questions. And in turn, we use different tools to collect quantitative data and qualitative information. So Elisa, if you don't mind, let's start with tracking polar bears. Um, and if you could share with our viewers today some of the methods and tools that we use and some of the questions a researcher might ask to better understand how and where polar bears use their sea ice habitat. Absolutely. So as Marisa was telling you, polar bears roam across the Arctic on Arctic sea ice. Now this is a huge, huge place and it's a very, very harsh environment. The conditions are cold and windy and it's almost impossible a lot of the year for humans to get out there and watch what polar bears are doing, especially since it's dark so much of the winter. But we can only better protect polar bears and understand them more thoroughly if we have better data and information, if we're learning about them. Well, how do we do that? if they're so far away in the dark and cold, well, we use technology. So since about the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we've been able to collar female adult polar bears with GPS collars. So at first they were radio collars, and then we could use GPS to talk to a satellite. And these collars track the polar bear when they're out on the sea ice and send the information to a satellite that researchers can then download these days right at home on their computer. And this way we are able to collect all sorts of information about where the polar bears are moving, what type of sea ice is where the bear is moving. We can see where the bears might overlap, how big their home ranges are, and we can compare the bears that we know have little cubs with older cubs with no cubs and see if they're making different decisions. And then we can see what happens over time as the sea ice is changing. Now, one of the coolest areas, I think, I'm biased, uh, to study polar bears is in Hudson Bay in Canada. And this Western Hudson Bay population is the one that I helped track and collar for a few years. And these polar bears are the best studied in the world because they're more accessible. And these were the first bears that we were able to link changes in their population and body condition to changes in Arctic sea ice. So these were the bears that really sounded the alarm that, hey, changes in sea ice are affecting polar bears. And we only were able to do this because of data we collected through technology like these tracking collars. So for a couple decades, we tracked adult females, but then we started thinking, you know, what are the males up to? They're important too. And what about the sub-adult bears, the kind of teenager bears that are still growing? We can't color them because they're still growing and the males next 
were too big so they couldn't fit a collar, they would just push them off their head. What could we do? So that's when we started thinking innovatively and trying to engineer new solutions. So in the past few years, we've been working with different groups to now shrink that technology down, now that technology is getting so much better, and we were putting GPS ear tags on adult males. And these GPS ear tags don't last quite as long as collars, but we were still finally able to get wonderful movement data from these males. And this even had a benefit in that if, uh, for example, a problem bear was captured, one that was very interested in the town of Churchill, uh, some bears come into the town and then they're captured and relocated. We could put an ear tag on those bears and warn the town if we saw the bear coming back. So that was through the Polar Bear Alert program as well in Manitoba. Very cool use of technology. Now we're learning so much more about what the adult males are up to. So we're getting a better picture of all the polar bears. But we wanted to take it even a step further. So part of science and conservation and working with animals is that you always want to be collecting the best data, but doing the least harm to animals. So you want them to just be doing their own thing. Naturally, we want to be the least invasive as possible as we can be. So though we know that collars and these ear tags don't really have an impact on the bears, they're quite used to them. And we've been able to compare bears that never were tracked with bears that were in their body condition and size. And we know that we want to even make it easier to track polar bears and to track more bears. So we started thinking, could we just simply attach a tracker to the fur? And so Polar Bears International worked with engineers at 3M and we're now trying a new type of tracker and we're calling it our Burr on Fur Project. And we're seeing if we can simply attach a tracker to a bear's fur and it would naturally fall out when the bear is molting in the spring. So we are working on this project, it's really exciting as a pilot project and we're getting some really great results and we're so excited to be thinking of new ways to track polar bears and get great information on even more bears. Very, very cool. Great, thanks Elisa. Thanks for sharing some of the, the reasons that we track polar bear movements and sharing some of those newest innovations um, in tracking devices and attachment methods. So let's switch gears a little bit um, and we're gonna talk mums and cubs. Now Polar Bears International is a leader in polar bear den research, researching new ways to find denning families under the snow, studying how they react to outside disturbances while in the den, and like I mentioned before, the behavior of mums and cubs when they first emerge from those dens. I'd like to pass it back to you, our staff scientist, Elisa, if you could share a bit more about um, some of the tools that we use to, to study mums and cubs. And with that, I'll say that we do have a question that's come in um, from a pre-K class in DC, and they would like to know what kinds of cameras um, do we use for polar bears in studying mums and cubs? Yeah, great question. So and cubs are arguably the most important group in the polar bear world because they are the next generation of polar bears. So it's very important that we learn how they're doing, that we help protect them, and that when we do study them, again, we are the least invasive as possible, or we bother them the least amount that we can. So we have used really fabulous technology to make sure that we're not disturbing moms and cubs at all, but that we're still learning a lot of great information about them. And this particular research project started many, many years ago in Alaska and has since progressed to Norway and hopefully will be in Canada one day in the future. Uh, but we started putting up cameras to watch moms and cubs as they emerge from their dens. So if we know where a mom and her new cubs are denning over the winter, we can bring researchers in with this equipment and they can snowmobile or snowshoe into an area that's still a delay from the den. So the mom shouldn't even be able to hear us coming. And we can put up a camera that could be solar powered and that is really protected by the harsh environments, by the wind and snow. The ER team there trekking in Norway to go deploy this equipment. And we put up this camera and it will run constantly and record what's happening. And then later in the season, we can go retrieve the camera when we know the moms and cubs are gone, download that camera information and then watch what we can watch and hopefully we see something cool. And what we can learn from this information is we can see what condition the mom is in. You can see some of that footage right here right now. So how is she doing? What is she doing? How many cubs does she have? How good do they look? Oh, this family looks pretty healthy. Uh, we can learn a lot from behavior and health from watching this sort of footage. So it has been a really fabulous project to be a part of. Um, 
Yeah, and it, it's only growing. So we're hoping to expand this. And I don't, the question about what particular kind of cameras, I know that they are 4K digital media cameras, uh, power roller. I don't actually know too much more than this. This is, unless Marisa knows, uh, I might have to pull our resident engineer in on this one, but we could get back to you. I don't know, Marisa, do you know the particular type? I know they're pretty nice cameras. I think we're going to have to bring our, our tech folks and DJ <laughs> in on the line on that one. And, and uh, of course, yeah. we can you can email your question further to us at questions at pbarris.org um, if we haven't answered them. We can, of course, follow up with that. But thank you for that great recap, Elisa. Um, I know everyone it always enjoys learning more about mums and cubs. And Polar Bears International has a long history of projects and partners. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. We know that the knowledge gained can really make a real difference for polar bear families. So that said, we're gonna shift gears again, and I wanna take this opportunity to head over uh, to one of our Arctic Ambassador Center partners, the Oregon Zoo, for a virtual field trip, where we will talk about how zoos and aquariums contribute to what we know about wild polar bears and get to hopefully see Nora the polar bear in her new habitat. So with that, I'll pass it back over to our friend Amy Cutting at the Oregon Zoo. Thanks, Marisa. Hey, welcome to Oregon Zoo, everybody, and our brand new polar passage habitat. Uh, we have, um, the habitat itself is complete. We're still waiting on a few more elements, um, mostly on the interpretive front. Uh, a lot of that was pushed back by COVID, but Nora is out enjoying her environment, as you can see. We'll keep the camera on her when she's doing something fun. Um, of course, uh, the important thing to remember is this is actually the final piece of a voter approved $125 million bond measure that's transformed 40% of our campus over the last 10 years. So it's very exciting. And I must say it's been especially fun to have Nora back um, doing the beta testing. She was from age one to two and then went to the Hogel Zoo for three years. So now she's back at age five and it's um, it's been incredibly exciting to see her enjoying some of the aspects of the habitat that we put in place with her in mind. So very exciting. But um, one of the things we did in this environment is to make sure that the public facing elements, the things that our guests are experiencing when they come to Polar Passage, really focus on the behind the scenes um, experience, um, showing people how we train animals and the kinds of relationships we have with them. We do a lot of training um, of polar bears in particular, a lot of our animals, but polar bears in particular, uh, for veterinary science as well as conservation science. So, you know, Elisa, Elisa talked about studying bears in the field and how very, very challenging that is. You've got really harsh conditions, you have rare opportunities to observe an animal directly, and the ability to actually follow an animal over time is, is really extremely limited. Whereas in zoos, of course, these animals live here for years, we see them every single day, and we know a lot about them, and we can train them to cooperate with us. So over the last you know, decade, we've been training a number of cooperative behaviors with bears um, for their own veterinary care. Um, and it's not a huge leap to translate those to conservation science. So, so over the last 10 years, we, we trained two polar bears to do voluntary blood draws. We use that for diagnostics. We've also used it for science. We trained a female bear to allow us to place a wildlife tracking collar, those collars that you sometimes see on the bears in the field. She actually allowed us to put that around her neck and um, was comfortable wearing it so we could test new technology. Actually, here she is. This is Tassel having her collar placed. She would walk around in the exhibit with it on. And we'll talk about some of the things that we were able to learn from that. But um, that was a really exciting opportunity. Um, I think it lends a little credence to the idea, too, that um, bears tolerate these pretty well. They're not, they're not very irritating to them. She, she quickly learned to ignore that she was wearing it at all. Um, so we did some cool stuff with that. We've taught a bear to walk on a treadmill to look at some of the energetics work we'll talk about. We've taught a bear to swim in a metabolic chamber. Um, and even our black bears have gotten into the act. Uh, we've, had, we've been training them to allow their fur to be bleached and for samples of fur to be plucked to, as part of a hair growth study. So we've been really involved in that and the new environment is intended largely to help us continue with that work. But, but what are the questions that you can answer with a zoo bear? You know, Lisa talked about what we learn from them in the field with the technologies that we deploy out there. The two main areas that we've really been focusing on with zoo bears and these cooperative behaviors are energetics. What does it cost a bear in terms of calories to do different activities? And then developing and testing new technologies that will ultimately be used for bears in the field. 
So when we say energetics, uh, we really need to understand, since polar bears live right on that cusp of um, getting enough calories, right? They live in a really harsh environment. Some subpopulations fast for a really long period of time. We really need to know how much energy they're expending traveling, whether it's walking or swimming, uh, in order to better understand how they're going to be impacted by changes in the sea ice. So we were asked to, with our partners at the U.S. Geological Survey, we were asked to have our bears walk on a treadmill. Um, and like so many other cooperative behaviors that we do with them, if you start slow and you work towards this idea of, hey, come on in here, it'll be fine, you'll get a treat. We, we take it at their pace, they can always walk away. Um, and this is Tossel a few years ago walking on the treadmill. She really didn't have an issue with it. Um, our partners at San Diego also did it with their adult female and they were able to collect data that helped us really for the first time put some numbers on what it costs a bear to travel, to walk, how many calories they're burning. But really the, the holy grail was sort of how can we figure out what it costs animals to swim? Uh, we know that bears are having to swim, and again, in sub subpopulations, particularly you know, Hudson Bay and also um, in the Alaska population, um, they're having to swim longer and longer distances. And there's concern, there's some anecdotal evidence that they're, they're losing, um, potentially losing cubs during that, that, those long swims and differently losing body condition. But in order to put some numbers to it, we really need to know what, how many calories are they burning when they're swimming. So we worked with our funders, and uh, this is Nora actually when she was younger, and we worked with some of our funders and the Oregon Zoo Foundation here to build a metabolic chamber swim flume. Um, and you'll see her swim into it. It's basically a half underwater room. And on one end, we had a um, endless pool motor that would uh, produce a current to push against her. And we were able to actually, uh, again, with our partners at US Geological Survey, take the air transfer, measure the air in that chamber. Because as an animal is working, they'll consume the oxygen and turn it into CO2. By measuring that change over time, you can actually get a number. You can get a number of calories, a metabolic rate that that animal is expending when they're swimming. It's never really been done before, but these are critical pieces of information for field scientists who are trying to understand the impacts of a, of a warming Arctic on polar bears and their energetic demands. So those were exciting projects. Um, the, the metabolic chamber, this flume, is incorporated into the new exhibit, so we still have it. And now we'll be able to work with Nora at age five, since our previous data were from her at age two. So um, very exciting opportunity. It turns out she actually also enjoys playing in it. It's sort of her own little personal uh, toy box. So she likes to shove toys in there um, so that keepers can't get them out. Uh, but uh, she's very entertaining in that way. Um, so, but then also developing new techniques is one area where zoos have enormous potential to assist the field researchers. These collars and these new technologies that Elisa was talking about, they're very, very expensive. And they're about to go put them thousands of miles away and kind of cross their fingers that they work. So the ability to, to test those items on zoo bears where they can cooperate. So again, here's Tossel allowing us to put that collar on her. We were testing a new technology, which was an accelerometer device. It's kind of like the thing that's in your cell phone that tells it whether it's, you know, landscape or portrait. And by watching Nora while wearing, or sorry, Tassel while wearing that collar, we were able to develop a library of different signals. And you can, you know, that um, you can see that there's different, there's three different planes of information that you're getting. But if you don't have a library saying this is what walking looks like, this is what swimming looks like, this is what eating looks like, those those signals don't carry a lot of information. But once you have a library that we built working with Tassel, this information coming back from the field from bears that are thousands of miles away you're able to actually interpret and understand. Combine that with the small cameras that were attached to those collars, and you've got really high quality information coming back from collars in a way that we've never seen before. So that's, well, that was a super exciting project for us. Um, with the voluntary blood draws that we do, we were also able to look at uh, turnover of isotopes in various tissues, which helped provide a tool for field researchers to understand what bears are eating in the wild and how recently uh, which is going to co-vary with how the sea, how, how the kind of sea ice year that they're seeing, and it allows us to predict kind of what's going to happen with bears as the sea ice retreats, and what's going to happen with their diet and their prey availability, and to me and to measure that. So these are incredibly valuable techniques um, and and ways that we can support working with our bears here uh, in cooperative, collaborative 
frankly, very enriching ways, uh, we can work with them here to help inform what people are learning in the field. Um, so anyway, lots of exciting opportunities, and we're trying to really uh, put a lot of that on view in our new habitat as well. We have a training demonstration area. We'll have lots of videos and interpretives about the, the conservation science collaboration, so it'll be pretty exciting. Anyway, that was a lot of information in a very short period of time, but uh, hope it was helpful. I'm going to go live. We lost audio from Marisa, so maybe Elisa, you can jump in real quick and we'll get Marisa's audio hooked back up. Oh, I think I'm here. Can ah. you hear me now? Oh, yes, you're back. User error on my part. Apologies, everyone. I had myself on mute. <laughs> what I was saying was thank you so much, Amy, for sharing all about the new exhibit and the importance of collaboration. We're so grateful to get to work with all the zoos and aquariums in our Arctic Ambassador Center network, and we really value uh, the meaningful contributions uh, that you have to conservation science and the conservation of polar bears. So with that, I've got several uh, sets of questions here from folks tuning in live. And so we've got some questions about the bears at the zoo, and we've also got some questions about bears in the wild. Um, and so I'm going to start with you, Amy. We've got a question from a pre-K class in DC, and they would like to know, how do you keep the habitat, Nora's habitat, cold enough at the zoo? That is a great question. So you guys are super familiar with the idea that polar bears live on ice and they live in the Arctic and it could be negative 50 degrees, like Elisa said. So it's important that we keep it at comfortable temperature for her. One of the things we've noticed about zoo bears is what they really seem to thrive on is having choices. So we don't necessarily say you will live at 10 degrees, right? We uh, give them lots of alternatives. So the pool water is chilled. There's a chilled cave that she can go in. There are sand pits where she can dig down deeper if she wants a cooler zone. What we find with polar bears and zoos is just because they can tolerate really cold temperatures doesn't mean they prefer them. And in fact, sometimes you'll see Nora laying out in the hot sun just soaking it in on an 80 degree day. I'm not sure I totally understand it, but that's her choice and we're, and we're, gonna, we're gonna let her make it. So it's really all about options for them. Also, in the, in the, when they're living in the Arctic, polar bears are going to put on a really thick layer of fat, right? They need that insulation to get through that difficult time period. In zoos, we don't see it. They don't put on quite that much fat, and so they're not going to overheat. Um, but we always make sure she has lots of choices to, to mandle, manage her own temperature. Great question. Thank you, Amy. And while we're on the topic of fat, uh, Elisa, I'm going to put this question to you. We have a question from Morella who'd like to know, what are the differences between the layer of fat under the fur of a polar bear versus under the fur of another marine mammal like a seal? And is there different ways that they stay warm? Yeah, really great question. So a similarity between the fat of a polar bear and the fat of a seal is that both are most useful when swimming. So we find that the polar bear's fat is more insulating when the bear is swimming because you can imagine wet fur isn't that great of an insulator. And of course, marine mammals like seals and whales really rely on their fat to also keep them warm in that frigid water. A big difference, though, is that polar bears do have fat. Their fat is a regular fat that we think of, whereas blubber is what we find in seals and whales. And there is a little bit of difference there. There is a difference between fat and blubber. Now, I'm not an expert on this. I do know one. Um, but really, a lot of the difference has to do with vascularization or blood flow around the area and kind of the structure of fat versus blubber. So that's a difference. But ultimately, um, you know, they're both for insulation. Polar bears pack on hundreds of pounds of fat at this time of year during the spring when they're eating lots of blubber from the sea. So polar bears very efficiently eat the seal blubber and turn it into body fat, which is pretty interesting. And right now is their best hunting time of year. So hopefully the wild bears are having a lot of fun gaining a lot of weight out there. Thank you, Elisa. I have another question for Elisa. Sarah would like to know how many polar bears there are in the wild. Yeah, well, it's really difficult to count polar bears in the wild. So we work with all the polar bear countries. There's five, Norway, Russia, Greenland, US, Alaska, and Canada uh, to count and compare polar bears. And our best estimate right now is anywhere between about 23,000 polar bears and 28,000 polar bears, uh, depending on where and when people are doing surveys. So our best estimate, approximately 25,000 polar bears in the wild, give or take. 
Okay, thanks for that, Elisa. And we know that as the sea ice continues to decline, that we'll see fewer polar bears in fewer areas, ultimately making them uh, more vulnerable to extinction. And we know that when we burn fossil fuels for energy, like things that power the places that we all live, work, play, go to school, or transporting goods from one place to another, we release what's called carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide is acting like a blanket, trapping heat around our planet that would have otherwise escaped. Um, and so that we know that when we talk about climate change in a more productive manner, where we uh, point towards the appropriate solutions to climate change, we can really move the needle and really normalize the concern for polar bears and the impacts of climate change. Um, so we encourage all of you to continue to talk about it and to continue to share your concern for polar bears and climate change. And KT, I'm not sure if, if you have uh, the video that we can queue up that sort of wraps all that together, the core story of polar bears and climate change. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. Thank you for sharing that, KT. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today on Earth Day, uh, which happens to be our final Tundra Connections broadcast of the spring Tundra Connections season. So we're so happy that you joined us. We hope that you learned something new about studying polar bears. And I want to thank our friends at the Oregon Zoo and Amy Cuddy for Cutting for being a panelist today. Uh, thank you for coming. Elisa, thank you for joining and sharing your knowledge and stories with us as well today. If you enjoyed learning today, be sure, if you're a younger learner, to ask an adult for permission and tune in to our future Tundra Connections broadcasts. Um, and also stay tuned for our summer beluga boat outreach and uh, the explore.org live cams that Elisa mentioned previously and you see uh, behind her there on the TV. And if you are still learning at home or spending more time online, be sure to check out our discussion topics on Flipgrid for more information about polar bears and protecting the habitats that people and polar bears depend on. Um, and lastly, I'll say, you know, this has been a really trying year for all of us. I think all of you are doing the impossible and you're doing a wonderful job, so keep it up. Uh, just continue to follow your curiosity and continue to learn and imagine the world you wish to live in and then really work together to build it. We know that there will be a mix of failure and success in trying something new. And as in conducting research, if you're creating or you're innovating or inventing, you've signed up for mistakes um, and that's okay, so keep at it. And keep talking about uh, your concern for polar bears and climate change. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come. <laughs>